Hello, I'm Robert Purchase, an orthopedic surgeon here in San Francisco, California with a specialty in shoulder surgery and sports medicine. The medical community has noted an association between atypical femoral fractures and long-term use of anti-osteoporosis medications that are collectively called bisphosphonates. Recently, I have had the opportunity to treat a handful of patients that have had this problem. Now each patient was unaware of the recent development, which is not all that surprising, and they had a boatload of questions, which is completely understandable. It dawned on me that there's a gap in the public awareness of the problem, and there aren't web-based sources of information. This video is intended to address both of these issues. The first thing I need to do is back up and provide some background. We all know that, the oste that osteoporosis, that gradual decrease in quality and strength of bone that occurs as we age is a huge problem for many reasons. One reason is that patients with osteoporosis are at greater risk of sustaining fractures or broken bones. The kind of fracture that is most relevant to this discussion is two types of hip fracture, intertrochanteric fractures and femoral neck fractures. These two fractures are all too common and can cause significant pain and dysfunction. Fortunately, Advances in treatment that have occurred over the last decades have improved the post-operative outcomes for these patients, but clearly an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Now there are many different kinds of medications to treat osteoporosis. However, bisphosphonates were recently developed uh, and have promised to work better with less side effects as compared to the other medications, a promise that they have largely lived up to. Common examples of bisphosphonates include Fosamex, Beneva, and actinol. Now, bisphosphonates have been shown to decrease the risk of osteoporotic fractures, including intertrochanteric and femoral neck fractures. Their mechanism of action is somewhat complex, but they essentially decrease the amount of bone resorption. So since there is less bone getting resorbed, there's more bone around. Since there's more bone around, there, the bone is less likely to break if you're unfortunate enough to trip and fall. Unfortunately, there has been a growing awareness of atypical femoral fractures in patients that have been on bisphosphonates for a very long time. Some patients are experiencing atypical fractures of their thigh bone, either in the subtrochanteric region, which is just below the hip region, or in the shaft of the bone. These atypical fractures were first reported beginning in 2007, yet still relatively little is understood about the problem. What we do know is that it is a rare problem. Well, how rare is it? No one is sure since that kind of large prospective study that can answer that question has not yet been published. However, the overwhelming weight of the evidence suggests that the benefit of intermediate term use of the medication outweighs any risks. These fractures occur after very low energy injuries such as a trip and fall. One of my patients simply snapped her leg stepping down from a cable car. Generally speaking, these patients have been on the bisphosphonate medication for a long time, generally longer than five years. The vast majority of patients have had a period of time where they experienced thigh pain prior to the bone actually breaking. This prodrome of thigh pain is typically four to 12 months long. Now, if you're unlucky enough to experience one of these fractures, more often than not, you would benefit from having surgery to stabilize it. There are two ways to stabilize a fracture either with a rod or with a plate and screw construct. Most patients are appropriate for the rod. Having the fracture stabilized will improve pain, allow early mobilization out of the bed, avoid the problem of deconditioning, and more often than not, just result in a better outcome than what non-operative care can provide. Non-operative care requires several weeks in bed with a leg in traction and is only appropriate in rare instances. I defer to your orthopedic surgeon about the specifics of your treatment. In my experience, patients with these atypical femoral fractures have many questions at this point, and I'm going to quickly touch on many of those questions, but I highly recommend that you talk to your orthopedic surgeon, your primary care physician, and or your endocrinologist for answers that consider your unique medical condition or situation. Now the first question is, well, why did this happen in the first place? This question comes from that cognitive dissonance of the realization that a medication that was supposed to stop fractures may have contributed to a fracture. For the explanation, we have to go back to the mechanism of action of these medications. Now, bone is constantly getting turned over or repaired in response to use. That is why living tissue can last for very long times under repetitive stress, while inanimate structures like bridges fail if they're not replaced. 
This process of bone repair or bone turnover is a coupled process involving first bone resorption and then bone formation. Bisphosphonates inhibit bone resorption. Over time, this can uncouple the bone turnover cycle, ultimately causing decreased bone turnover or bone repair. This decreased bone turnover allows for the accumulation of micro damage. The micro damage can accumulate to form stress fractures, and unfortunately, stress fractures can, can go on to complete themselves. The second question is, well, what about your other leg? Obviously, the other leg has been subjected to the same medication and has a similar risk of developing a stress fracture. As rare as these atypical femur fractures are, there are some people that have presented with both thigh bro bones broken at the same time, or had the other leg break shortly thereafter, or they had evidence of a stress fracture noted sometime later. Therefore, it is recommended that the other femur, the other leg, be evaluated with, with x-rays. If there is evidence of a developing stress fracture, either with thigh pain or with x-ray changes, prophylactic surgery, meaning fixing the fracture before it completes itself, should be at least discussed. The next question is, should you take the bisphosphonate medication after surgery to fix the broken leg? There is limited data in the literature to guide us, but I recommend that you do not take the medication in the post-op period. In my opinion, which is informed by current medical literature, continuing to take the medication can delay healing of the fracture and increase the odds of having a problem in the other leg. When to restart the bisphosphonate medication is best answered with your visit with a primary care physician and or endocrinologist, but it should be after the femur fracture has solidly healed. Obviously, your orthopedic surgeon would be able to tell you when that has occurred. The next question is, should you have even been taking the medication in the first place? Well, this one's tough because hindsight is 2020. but these atypical fractures are very rare, and it appears that these medications prevent many more problems than they cause. Now, if we could predict how or when these problems were to occur, occur at a point where we can intervene to stop the fracture from happening, that would obviously be preferable. What do you do if you've been taking a bisphosphonate for a long time and your thigh hurts? That's an easy one. Stop the medication and then seek evaluation from your primary care physician, orthopedic surgeon, and or endocrinologist right away. But what do you do if you've been taking a bisphosphonate medication for a long time and your thigh does not hurt? That one is a little bit harder to answer beyond to say that you should schedule an office visit with your primary care physician, orthopedic surgeon, and or endo endocrinologist at your convenience. Some doctors are recommending a bisphosphonate holiday. That's when the patient stops the medication for a period of time and resumes it at some point in the future. It is suggested that this is an effective way to maximize the medication's benefits while minimizing its risks. Unfortunately, there is little to no data that speaks to how long one can take the medication before you need to take a holiday, or how long that drug holiday should be, or even if such an approach would prevent these atypical fractures from occurring at all. Obviously, there's a lot of work left to be done in regards to research. Well, you can tell that this is a topic that will evolve in time as some of these issues get clarified, but I thank you for your interest. I hope that you found these comments helpful. Please remember, all comments in this video and on the site, including the comments contained within, are general in nature. They do not apply to any specific clinical scenario or any individual patient. The comments are meant to provide general background as an introduction to complex topics. The comments posted here are not meant as medical advice, nor should they be regarded as a substitute for examination, diagnosis, and medical care provided by a licensed and qualified health professional. All viewers are encouraged to see their personal physician regularly. All cases and clinical information presented represent examples of general themes, presentations, or issues. They do not represent a single case or the information of a particular patient. Your feedback and comments are encouraged. However, please do not post information that can identify any individual, including specific questions regarding medical care. Thank you.